No, no. no. Okay. Well, good afternoon, and I'm glad we've got our time figured out. So we will probably use all 20 minutes slash 22 minutes of our talking time, and then hopefully leave some time for questions. Uh, so it's not too unfamiliar for Charlie and I to team up since we are on a project that's funded together. So we'll be talking about Gordon Mistletoe, what, who, and how, and there's lots of people in this room to thank that have contributed to being part of the study. Some of you may have received a survey from Charlie's group this summer, this fall, um, or have participated through providing sites and other pieces. So thank you, thank you, thank you for the access, the information, the time, the sharing of knowledge, and of course, the continued interest. So where are we going? So what is Dwarf Mistletoe? who is managing dwarf mistletoe and how, and then what is that impact, the how, what's going on on the ground. And then finally, why we're funded by the Minnesota Invasive Terrestrial Plant and Pest Center, MPEG. And the reason is because jack pine dwarf mistletoe, or those of you from the West, lodge pine dwarf mistletoe, same species, different name, uh, is in Manitoba and could enter it into Minnesota as an invasive dwarf mistletoe. So let's get started quickly with what dwarf mistletoe is. But before we get into the dwarf mistletoe, um, since I'm a forester, let's talk about where mistletoe is found in black spruce. So black spruce in Minnesota, um, approximately 10% of our forest and is the second most harvested pulpwood species. Typically see it managed in even age silvicultural systems which can include uh, clear-cut regeneration harvest followed by aerial seedings. And this is typically done in the winter under good frozen conditions. If we think about some of the stand dynamics and successional dynamics of black spruce, uh, we can come back from a stand replacing disturbance, historically fire, um, now clear-cut, um, established from seed, and then through time without fire or uh, large sand replacing disturbances, we can move from an even age stand to an uneven age stand. With a big part of that being wind with these very shallow rooted species and then also disease. And that's where we'll get into the disease. Eastern spruce dwarf mistletoe. Uh, so this is a native Parasitic plant it is dioecious. It has a spread rate of 2.3 feet per year. So we're blazing across those black spruce stands. <laughs> but if you think about how slow black spruce actually grows in Minnesota, this is a pretty big spread rate for a slow growing species. Uh, it also kills 75% of black spruce in 17 years. So this is different than some of our Western dwarf mistletoes, which are kind of nuisance species, depending on how you look at them, or can provide a lot of valuable habitat, but often don't result in mortality. Eastern, uh, dwarf, Eastern spruce dwarf mistletoe does kill trees. So it is a mortality agent and is one of the bigger mortality <coughs> agents of black spruce. Uh, a cool fact about dwarf mistletoe that um, really, really um, spice up any conversation you're having is the fact that dwarf mistletoe actually shoots its seeds out and it goes like 65 miles an hour, right? Brian, I've exactly. got that exactly, exactly 65 miles an hour. So we're talking about a species that like physically <laughs> propels its seed faster than some of us can drive on a, on a road. So, black spruce, great species. There was a lot of research and a lot of interest when we going back in the history in Minnesota from the 1930s, 1960s. Then there's a little bit kind of falling off um, in the 70s and 80s, but there's been um, kind of a renewed interest in understanding both lowland conifers and black spruce in Minnesota. So, I'm going to turn it over to Charlie and let him talk about the who of the study. 
Great, thanks, Marcella. And some people thought when I talk about the who, I might talk about the group from the 60s and 70s, and they say, rock on. But actually, I'm going to talk about loggers and foresters, because you are the people who make decisions about what stands to manage, how you're going to praise those stands for sales, um, is the dwarf mistletoe present, what are the treatments that you're going to apply, and so on. So our part of the project is really trying to assess it, um, treatment methods and the effectiveness of those methods. And we did it in uh, three different counties, Cooch, my task in St. Louis counties. Why those three? Because 95% of, um, of the black spruce that's harvested on county lands, county forest managed lands, comes from those three counties. And the other 5% is from about 10 other counties. So it really seemed important to focus our study on those three counties. So we asked loggers and foresters a number of questions relating to, can you identify dwarf mistletoe? Do you understand the need to eradicate it? Are the treatments implemented as they're designed? Are the treatments effective? And do any impediments exist to your ability to actually implement those treatments on the ground? Again, loggers and foresters. So we've done interviews with loggers. We've done focus groups with loggers. We did the online survey, which is what I'm going to talk about here. We've also done some focus groups with foresters. So I'm only going to talk about a small part of what our study was. So we surveyed foresters online between April and June of last year. As Marcella said, thank you if you participated in that study. So there were 186 people who received the online survey. Um, they represented folks in county, state, federal, tribal, and industrial foresters. We received responses from 108 individuals. So we had a response rate of about 58%. Because a large majority of our um, target group were from the state, they also represented the largest percentage of our respondents. On average, uh, respondents had 15 years of experience, and, uh, but a quarter of them were relatively new, uh, between one and five years of work in the woods. They averaged 11 years of black spruce timber sales work. So a fairly not knowledgeable group about working in black spruce on the ground. So one of our questions was, can you actually identify dwarf mistletoe? 94% said that they were somewhat to very knowledgeable um, about dwarf mistletoe. 93% said they used witches' brooms as their primary indicator of the presence of dwarf mistletoe in a stand. And so we also asked them um, to, to rate their um, confidence in doing something like the ability to I correctly identified dwarf mistletoe in the field. 97% said that they were somewhat very confident that they could identify dwarf mistletoe in a stand. And that their timber appraisal methods could detect it, it was about 90% said that also. And they said that 89% of the time, loggers were unable to find additional pockets of dwarf mistletoe in the timber sales that they had set up. So you're doing a pretty good job, it sounds like, of identifying dwarf mistletoe's presence within timber stands. So do you understand the need to eradicate it as part of your management prescription in harvesting that stand? And somewhat surprisingly, only 65% said that they're somewhat very concerned about its impact to the future ecological health of um, black spruce stands. And 44% believe it had slight to no impact. And so as um, Marcella said, it really tends to move slowly through a stand. Some, some of our respondents have written comments said, it's been present in our forest for hundreds or thousands of years. In some cases, it's very present. In others, it's less so. So it, it's not having a large impact on the management of our forests. 76% said that there's some sort of a guiding document that's used that say if, dwarf missile, if you're harvesting a uh, black spruce stand, this is what you should do. And 63 said that conventional systems using a hot saw was really the best way to try to manage black spruce rather than using a cut to length system. The most common prescriptive method used was something related to um, cut it or tramp um, all stems that are at least five feet in height. Infrequently, we're doing any sort of post treatment, so using a roller chopper. Um, some said they might like to try fire um, or going in there hand felling. In most cases, we're not doing any of that. 
but 89% said that they monitor sometime within the first nine years post-harvest. But they said that monitoring is really for a regeneration check, not to see if that treatment was effective in terms of his um, dwarf mistletoe coming back into the stands. Because I had to have a complicated graph, this is it. <laughs> and so we, we asked people, um, what treatments are you applying and how effective do you think that treatment is? So what the top it says, about half of them said their treatments are somewhat very effective. And about a quarter of the respondents said, you know, I really don't know. And the reason is that they're doing these regeneration checks soon afterward. And in the written comments, they said, we're probably not going to re-enter that stand for another 60, 70, 80, 90 years. So we really don't know how effective our treatment is. By the time somebody else goes back in there, I'm long retired. And so the most common treatments that were being applied was something related, again, to severing or tramping all stems at least five feet in height. The, the numbers here represent the number of respondents who are using a treatment like that. They could respond to more than one treatment. And then having a harvest buffer between um, a dwarf mistletoe infected area and then non-infected areas. On average, that buffer was about 116 feet. And then there were other sort of things that people were doing, including uh, retaining all dwarf mistletoe. So in terms of effectiveness, the things that are not effective appear at the bottom. So the things that we really want to look at in terms of being effective are those that have blue and more yellow in there. And so from the perspective of respondents, the things that you're doing tend to be fairly um, effective in terms of um, controlling black screws on the ground. The dwarf mistletoe. We asked foresters, what do you think are the top issues or impediments facing loggers? And they said the extra time that it takes to cut all those little stems that are really non merchantable Or black spruce uh, ground conditions, especially in some of the previous winters when it wasn't cold out there. Or the impacts to the equipment, equipment during those treatments. Just having a um, brush all those extra trees out there, exposing hoses um, to, to hydraulic breaks and so on. For foresters, the top three were lack of money and time to implement the treatments and actually go back afterward and take care of anything that might need further treatment. Bring in a roller chopper to go in there and hand fell. They said in most cases we don't have the time or the money to be able to do that. There's not enough impact information on um, what do we know about dwarf mistletoe? Are these treatments really effective or not? And then the uh, um, lack of follow-up money to do monitoring in subsequent years after that harvest to, look, um, to see what do we really know about black spruce um, treatments. And then the, the last one was the lack of coordination among landowners. Several of you wrote in that just because I'm doing a good job controlling black spruce in my timber sale, if I run up against an adjoining landowner's property that has infection on it, I know that's going to move into my regenerating stand, and I can't do anything about that. And so you were concerned about that in addition. So the main takeaways from our survey of you, the WHO, were that you're able to identify and you understand the need to eradicate dwarf mistletoe but it's been historically present on the landscape for a long, long period of time. And some people said thousands of years. Um, and its infection rate is very, some said its infection rate is very high in their area. Others said, I hardly ever see it. You know to remove all stems greater than five feet tall. Conventional logging is most effective as compared to pipe the length. But there's a lack of resources to monitor, to go back in and do post-sale treatments. <laughs> The lack of ability to coordinate your timber sales with adjoining landowners. And you just want to know more about the effectiveness of the treatments that you are implementing. So with that, we'll bring Marcella back to talk about how um, uh, structure and composition affect the dwarf mistletoe. Thanks, Charlie. So Charlie mentioned this idea of information of how dwarf mistletoe is influencing the composition and structure. So that's one of the other parts of the project is to understand what do these forests look like. Uh, so this study used 10 different sites across northern Minnesota. And we use this kind of, uh, we use this 
broken up sampling design to try to capture the spatial variability with dwarf mistletoe, since it is very spatially explicit. So we had three different levels of mistletoe infection, no mistletoe, a uh, low mistletoe, so under about 50%, and then a high mistletoe over 50% of the stand infested. Uh, each stand had this 18 subplots, and each subplot had uh, three seedling pots. So how this kind of look can look like in a stand is um, you can kind of see it's spatially uh, grouped, and you can also see where mistletoe is versus where it isn't. Uh, but there's also kind of flexibility in how these transects were set up. So that way, depending on how the sand is shaped, since we all work in just great square or rectangular trans or sand boundaries, right? Yeah, everyone's got squares and rectangles all the time, especially in black spruce, that this can give you the flexibility to shift these around. But the goal was to keep the 18 subplots and kind of that kind of grouping with the transects to be able to look at and quantify dwarf mistletoe. So the breakdown came across pretty well. So no mistletoe stands, we saw no mistletoe. Our low mistletoe stand, about 50% of those plots in those stands had mistletoe. And our high mistletoe had 93% of those subplots having mistletoe. So we definitely had breakdowns of what we were hoping for. So I'm going to have numbers because we are a quantitative field in natural resources. So we are going to talk about some numbers. We're going to look at some trends. These numbers are also in metric, uh, but there is always the translation bar at the bottom. So that will get you back to the English unit. So Density, if we're looking at density across the three different treatments, so no mistletoe, low mistletoe, and high mistletoe, uh, one of the things that might be interesting is the total density uh, that no mistletoe and high mistletoe are pretty similar, actually non-significantly different. Uh, we get a dip down in that low mistletoe. We also kind of see a dip kind of when we're looking at the total Y, I should have asked for the roving mic, Eli, this is really hard to say. I'm okay. I'm going to do it. But. Sure. <laughs> um, and then we see this kind of increase in our dead as we go from uh, no mistletoe. Well, we see no mistletoe, we have mortality, and that is most likely due to competition related mortality. So these are really healthy stands. We're getting density dependent mortality. So we're losing those smaller diameter classes. We have mortality in our low mistletoe stand, but we really get this jump up in mortality when we move into that high mistletoe stand. And I'm going to move on to looking at the species next, because that's where we start to see some interesting differences come across, where when we don't have mistletoe in a stand, we have over twice the live basal area of black spruce. So that's a huge difference between when we're looking at what mistletoe is influencing the species composition. We also see, again, that jump up of dead black spruce, and then the shift in the amount of tamarack that comes in with that severity level of mistletoe. And that's probably not surprising that we create these pockets, we create this light environment, and we create a space if the seed source is available for tamarack to come in. <laughs> An interesting aspect, too, that uh, we found in the high mistletoe, or we, I use in the colloquial term, my grad student Rachel and Ella and Vanessa found was that under severe conditions, mistletoe was actually impacting tamarack. So we were getting mortality, we were getting infestations occurring on tamarack, which is a super rare event, and you need really high pressure from the mistletoe for that to happen. So let's look at some of these diameter distributions. So how are we seeing this shift again in species composition and structure? So our no mistletoe stand predominantly dominated by live black spruce with mortality of black spruce occurring in these smaller diameter classes. We shift over to the low mistletoe stand. We see the shift with orange being that black spruce. We get other live species coming in, a lot of balsam fir. And then we also see this increased amount of tamarack. And then finally, we're going to see that shift even more if we move to the high mistletoe stand, 
where we see a decrease in the amount of live black spruce and a really big increase in, again, that amount of other species coming in the stand. So you're looking at a change in your species composition. So depending on why you're managing these stands, this can mean that you're getting a lot more species diversity coming in. So we have twice the amount of species when we look at mistletoe presence. So we're talking two to four species. And again, in a lowland system, that's a big jump. Um, we also see this change um, in seedlings diversity with those low mistletoe increasing in species diversity, whereas we're seeing no difference between the no mistletoe and high mistletoe. So let's look at our regeneration. So if we were just looking at all species combined, we're getting a lot of regeneration across all of the sites. So whether you have mistletoe or not, we're having regeneration. However, that regeneration is really different based on the species that we're getting. So again, the no mistletoe, black spruce is double the amount that you're getting in those no, low mistletoe or high mistletoe stands. So you're getting twice the amount of regeneration. And if you're thinking about, this is advanced regeneration. So there is a good amount of advanced regeneration that is under these black spruce stands already prior to any harvesting. We see a shift with tamarack, and then interestingly, more. we get balsam fir starting to move in as mistletoe impacts the stand. And then finally, mistletoe can impact our regeneration and can impact seedlings. So we are seeing this increase in um, amount of mistletoe impacting both live black spruce seedlings and also causing mortality of these smaller diameter, these smaller size classes, which is your future forest. So what does this mean? Mistletoe influences structure and composition of black spruce forest. Again, coming back to why we're here and from our funding source, jack pine dwarf mistletoe is an invasive species. So we're trying to understand our native species to be able to make predictions of how we can sample for this invasive, what impact it may have on our jack pine resource and what that could look like. So wrapping up what it is, this is a native damage antigen to black spruce. Who managers are aware of black spruce? and treatments are occurring, but there's uncertainty and questions remaining. And then how black spruce dwarf mistletoe changes species composition and structure. So again, thank you, thank you to everyone in the room who has participated and is a part of the study, to the many people in the civil lab who have assisted with data collection, and then for our funding sources. And we've even left two minutes and 30 seconds for questions, so. I'm interested in just your perspective on good versus bad and then taking that back to objectives because this could be argued either way. It seems like you know, place pond management is better. Yeah. So, those of you online, so the perspective of good versus bad and how that relates to management perspective. Yeah. And so, uh, from the perspective, it depends what you're managing, right? I guess that's what a silviculture says to say all the time. It depends what, what are your goals and your values. So if your goal is to provide a high quality pulp species like black spruce to market, or mistletoe is changing that. It's changing your ability to meet that management goal and objective. If you're looking at increasing species diversity, um, you're seeing a shift in the species that are a part of your forest community with dwarf mistletoe. So you're getting more large coming in, you're getting balsam fir, we, they notice uh, spruce or white spruce come in, a few different oak species, aspen, uh, white pine. So there's a whole host of species that was coming in, including northern white cedar, that was coming in in some of these mortality ponds. So it really comes back to why, why are you managing, what are your goals, and what are your objectives. So. You know, I mean, history on some of these sites, um, sometimes ecologists uh, call this reciprocal succession. So it would be interesting to know what was 
at these issues? Yeah, so we don't have the exact history, but all the stamps are between 60 and 100 years old, had a similar site index, similar ability to access them. So we tried to control as many of the variables as we could to have as much uniformity as possible. Uh, but like Charlie mentioned, um, many of these, we don't know the exact origin of these stamps, so whether they were fire origin, whether uh, how they were or originated, but we did our best to kind of control as much as we could, given that, that we would need to somehow find files 60 to 100 years ago. Okay, and I think I'm all done. Thank you. Thanks,